Isambard Kingdom Brunel, FRS, was an English mechanical and civil engineer who built dockyards, the Great Western Railway, a series of steamships including the first propeller-driven transatlantic steamship and numerous important bridges and tunnels. His designs revolutionized public transport and modern engineering. Though Brunel's projects were not always successful, they often contained innovative solutions to long-standing engineering problems. During his short career, Brunel achieved many engineering firsts, including assisting in the building of the first tunnel under a navigable river and development of SS Great Britain, the first propeller-driven ocean-going iron ship, which was at the time also the largest ship ever built. Brunel set the standard for a very well-built railway, using careful surveys to minimize grades and curves. This necessitated expensive construction techniques and new bridges and viaducts, and the two-mile-long box tunnel. One controversial feature was the wide gauge, a broad gauge of 7 AFTA 1 A 4 A in, instead of what was later to be known as standard gauge of 4 AFTA 8 A 1 A 2 A in. The wider gauge added to passenger comfort but made construction much more expensive and caused difficulties when eventually it had to interconnect with other railways using the narrower gauge. As a result of the regulating the Gauge of Railways Act 1846, the gauge was changed to standard gauge throughout the GWR network. Brunel astonished Britain by proposing to extend the Great Western Railway westward to North America by building steam-powered iron-hulled ships. He designed and built three ships that revolutionized naval engineering. In 2002, Brunel was placed second in a BBC public poll to determine the 100 greatest Britons. In 2006, the bicentenary of his birth, a major program of events celebrated his life and work under the name Brunel 200. Early life, the son of French civil engineer Sir Marc Isambard Brunel and Sophia Kingdom, Isambard Kingdom Brunel was born on April 9, 1806 in Britain Street, Portsea, Portsmouth, Hampshire, where his father was working on block-making machinery. He had two older sisters, Sophia and Emma, and the whole family moved to London in 1808 for his father's work. Brunel had a happy childhood, despite the family's constant money worries, with his father acting as his teacher during his early years. His father taught him drawing and observational techniques from the age of four and Brunel had learned Euclidean geometry by eight. During this time he also learned fluent French and the basic principles of engineering. He was encouraged to draw interesting buildings and identify any faults in their structure. When Brunel was eight he was sent to Dr. Morel's boarding school in Hove, where he learned the classics. His father, a Frenchman by birth, was determined that Brunel should have access to the high-quality education he had enjoyed in his youth in France. Accordingly, at the age of 14, the younger Brunel was enrolled first at the College of Cohen in Normandy, then at Le Corps Copyright d'Ion IV in Paris. When Brunel was 15, his father, who had accumulated debts of over a £5,000, was sent to a debtor's prison. After three months went by with no prospect of release, Mark let it be known that he was considering an offer from the Tsar of Russia. In August 1821, facing the prospect of losing a prominent engineer, the government relented and issued Mark a £5,000 to clear his debts in exchange for his promise to remain in Britain. When Brunel completed his studies at Henri IV in 1822, his father had him presented as a candidate at the renowned engineering school of Permil Cold Polytechnique, but as a foreigner he was deemed ineligible for entry. Brunel subsequently studied under the prominent master clockmaker and horologist Abraham Louis Breguet, who praised Brunel's potential in letters to his father. In late 1822, having completed his apprenticeship, Brunel returned to England. Thames Tunnel. Brunel worked for several years as an assistant engineer on the project to create a tunnel under London's River Thames between Rotherhithe and Wapping, with tunnelers driving a horizontal shaft from one side of the river to the other under the most difficult and dangerous conditions. Brunel's father, Mark, was the chief engineer, and the project was funded by the Thames Tunnel Company. The composition of the riverbed at Rotherhithe was often little more than waterlogged sediment and loose gravel. An ingenious tunneling shield designed by Mark Brunel helped protect workers from cave-ins, 
but two incidents of severe flooding halted work for long periods, killing several workers and badly injuring the younger Brunel. The latter incident, in 1828, killed the two most senior miners, and Brunel himself narrowly escaped death. He was seriously injured, and spent six months recuperating. The event stopped work on the tunnel for several years. Though the Thames Tunnel was eventually completed during Mark Brunel's lifetime, his son had no further involvement with the tunnel proper, only using the abandoned works at Rotherhithe to further his abortive gas experiments. This was based on an idea of his father's, but despite interest from several parties the experiments were discontinued after 1834. Bridges Brunel is perhaps best remembered for designing the Clifton Suspension Bridge in Bristol. Spanning over 702 Ft, and nominally 249 Ft above the River Avon, it had the longest span of any bridge in the world at the time of construction. Brunel submitted four designs to a committee headed by Thomas Telford, but Telford rejected all entries, proposing his own design instead. Vociferous opposition from the public forced the organizing committee to hold a new competition, which was won by Brunel. Afterwards, Brunel wrote to his brother in law, the politician Benjamin Hawes, of all the wonderful feats I have performed, since I have been in this part of the world, I think yesterday I performed the most wonderful. I produced unanimity among fifteen men who were all quarreling about that most ticklish subject a Euro taste. Work on the Clifton Bridge started in 1831, but was suspended due to the Queen Square riots caused by the arrival of Sir Charles Etherell in Clifton. The riots drove away investors, leaving no money for the project, and construction ceased. Brunel did not live to see the bridge finished, although his colleagues and admirers at the Institution of Civil Engineers felt it would be a fitting memorial, and started to raise new funds and to amend the design. Work recommenced in 1862 and was completed in 1864, five years after Brunel's death. In 2011 it was suggested, by historian and biographer Adrian Vaughan, that Brunel did not design the bridge, as eventually built, as the later changes to its design were substantial. His views reflected a sentiment stated 52 years earlier by Tom Rolt in his 1959 book Brunel. Re-engineering of suspension chains recovered from an earlier suspension bridge was one of many reasons given why Brunel's design could not be followed exactly. In May 1845 Hungerford Bridge, a suspension footbridge across the Thames near Charing Cross Station in London, was opened. Its central span was 676.5 AFT, and its cost was a £106,000. It was replaced by a new railway bridge in 1859, and the suspension chains were used to complete the Clifton Suspension Bridge. The Clifton Suspension Bridge still stands, and over four a million vehicles traverse it every year. Brunel designed many bridges for his railway projects, including the Royal Albert Bridge spanning the River Tamar at Saltash near Plymouth, Somerset Bridge, the Windsor Railway Bridge, and the Maidenhead Railway Bridge over the Thames in Berkshire. This last was the flattest, widest brick arch bridge in the world and is still carrying mainline trains to the west, even though today's trains are about ten times heavier than in Brunel's time. Throughout his railway building career, but particularly on the South Devon and Cornwall railways where economy was needed and there were many valleys to cross, Brunel made extensive use of wood for the construction of substantial viaducts. These have had to be replaced over the years as their primary material, kyanized Baltic pine became uneconomical to obtain. Brunel designed the Royal Albert Bridge in 1855 for the Cornwall Railway, after Parliament rejected his original plan for a train ferry across the Hammerwarzia Euro the estuary of the tidal Tamar, Tavian Liner. The bridge consists of two main spans of 455 AFT, 100 AFT above mean high spring tide, plus 17 much shorter approach spans. Opened by Prince Albert on May 2, 1859, it was completed in the year of Brunel's death. Several of Brunel's bridges over the Great Western Railway might be demolished because the line is to be electrified, and there is inadequate clearance for overhead wires. Buckinghamshire County Council is negotiating to have further options pursued, in order that all nine of the remaining historic bridges on the line can be saved. Great Western Railway In the early part of Brunel's life, 
the use of railways began to take off as a major means of transport for goods. This influenced Brunel's involvement in railway engineering, including railway bridge engineering. In 1833, before the Thames Tunnel was complete, Brunel was appointed chief engineer of the Great Western Railway, one of the wonders of Victorian Britain, running from London to Bristol and later Exeter. The company was founded at a public meeting in Bristol in 1833, and was incorporated by Act of Parliament in 1835. It was Brunel's vision that passengers would be able to purchase one ticket at London Paddington and travel from London to New York, changing from the Great Western Railway to the Great Western Steamship at the terminus in Nayland, South Wales. He surveyed the entire length of the route between London and Bristol himself, with the help of many including his solicitor Jeremiah Osborne of Bristol law firm Osborne Clark who on one occasion rode a Sambard Kingdom Brunel down the River Avon himself to survey the bank of the river for the route. Brunel made two controversial decisions, to use a broad gauge of 7 AFT for the track, which he believed would offer superior running at high speeds, and to take a route that passed north of the Marlborough Downs our Euro an area with no significant towns, though it offered potential connections to Oxford and Gloucester a Euro, and then to follow the Thames Valley into London. His decision to use broad gauge for the line was controversial in that almost all British railways to date had used standard gauge. Brunel said that this was nothing more than a carryover from the mine railways that George Stevenson had worked on prior to making the world's first passenger railway. Brunel proved through both calculation and a series of trials that his broader gauge was the optimum size for providing both higher speeds and a stable and comfortable ride to passengers. In addition the wider gauge allowed for larger carriages and thus greater freight capacity. Drawing on Brunel's experience with the Thames Tunnel, the Great Western contained a series of impressive achievements a Euro soaring viaducts such as the one in Iverbridge, specially designed stations, and vast tunnels including the Box Tunnel, which was the longest railway tunnel in the world at the time. There is an anecdote that the Box Tunnel may have been deliberately oriented so that the rising sun shines all the way through it on Brunel's birthday. The initial group of locomotives ordered by Brunel to his own specifications proved unsatisfactory, apart from the North Star locomotive, and 20-year-old Daniel Gutch was appointed as superintendent of locomotive engines. Brunel and Gutch chose to locate their locomotive works at the village of Swindon, at the point where the gradual ascent from London turned into the steeper descent to the Avon Valley at Bath. Brunel's achievements ignited the imagination of the technically minded Britons of the age, and he soon became quite notable in the country on the back of this interest. After Brunel's death the decision was taken that standard gauge should be used for all railways in the country. Despite the Great Western's claim of proof that its broad gauge was the better, the decision was made to use Stevenson's standard gauge, mainly because this had already covered a far greater amount of the country. However, by May 1892 when the broad gauge was abolished the Great Western had already been relayed as dual gauge and so the transition was a relatively painless one. At the original Welsh terminus of the Great Western Railway at Nayland, Sections of the broad gauge rails are used as handrails at the quayside, and a number of information boards there depict various aspects of Brunel's life. There is also a larger than life bronze statue of him holding a steamship in one hand and a locomotive in the other. The present London Paddington station was designed by Brunel and opened in 1854. Examples of his designs for smaller stations on the Great Western and associated lines which survive in good condition include Mortimer. Chalbury and Bridgend and Cullum. Surviving examples of wooden train sheds in his style are at Frome and Kingware. The great achievement that was the Great Western Railway has been immortalised at Swindon Steam Railway Museum and the Didcot Railway Centre. The Didcot Railway Centre is notable for having a reconstructed segment of 7 FTA 1 Afora and Brunel gauge track, as well as a very rare working steam locomotive in the same gauge. Overall, there were negative views as to how society viewed the railways. Some landowners felt the railways were a threat to amenities or property values and others requested tunnels on their land so the railway could not be seen. Brunel's Atmospheric Caper Though unsuccessful, another of Brunel's interesting use of technical innovations was the Atmospheric Railway, the extension of the Great Western Railway southward from Exeter towards Plymouth. 
technically the South Devon Railway, though supported by the GWR. Instead of using locomotives, the trains were moved by Clegg and Samudler's patented system of atmospheric traction, whereby stationary pumps sucked air from a pipe placed in the center of the track. The section from Exeter to Newton was completed on this principle, and trains ran at approximately 68 miles per hour. Pumping stations with distinctive square chimneys were sited at two-mile intervals. 15-inch pipes were used on the level portions, and 22-inch pipes were intended for the steeper gradients. The technology required the use of leather flaps to seal the vacuum pipes. The natural oils were drawn out of the leather by the vacuum, making the leather vulnerable to water, rotting it and breaking the fibers when it froze during the winter of 1847. It had to be kept supple with tallow, which is attractive to rats. The flaps were eaten, and vacuum operation lasted less than a year, from 1847 to September 10, 1848. Deterioration of the valve due to the reaction of tannin and iron oxide has been cited as the last straw that sank the project, as the continuous valve began to tear from its rivets over most of its length, and the estimated replacement cost of a £25,000 was considered prohibitive. It has been suggested that the whole project was an expensive flop. In Brunel's favor, it has been noted that he had the courage to call a halt to the venture instead of struggling on with it at greater cost. The system never managed to prove itself. The accounts of the SDR for 1848 suggest that atmospheric traction cost 3s 1d per mile compared to 1s 4d mile for conventional steam power. A number of South Devon railway engine houses still stand, including that at Totens and at Starcross, on the estuary of the River Aches, which is a striking landmark, and a reminder of the atmospheric railway, also commemorated as the name of the village pub. A section of the pipe, without the leather covers, is preserved at the Didcot Railway Centre. Transatlantic Shipping In 1835, before the Great Western Railway had opened, Brunel proposed extending its transport network by boat from Bristol across the Atlantic Ocean to New York City. The Great Western Steamship Company was formed by Thomas Guppy for that purpose. It was widely disputed whether it would be commercially viable for a ship powered purely by steam to make such long journeys. Technological developments in the early 1830s are Euro including the invention of the surface condenser, which allowed boilers to run on salt water without stopping to be clear need a Euro made longer journeys more possible, but it was generally thought that a ship would not be able to carry enough fuel for the trip and have room for a commercial cargo. Brunel formulated the theory that the amount a ship could carry increased as the cube of its dimensions, whereas the amount of resistance a ship experienced from the water as it traveled only increased by a square of its dimensions. This would mean that moving a larger ship would take proportionately less fuel than a smaller ship. To test this theory, Brunel offered his services for free to the Great Western Steamship Company, which appointed him to its building committee and entrusted him with designing its first ship the Great Western. When it was built, the Great Western was the longest ship in the world at 236 ft with a 250-foot keel. The ship was constructed mainly from wood, but Brunel added bolts and iron diagonal reinforcements to maintain the keel strength. In addition to its steam-powered paddle wheels, the ship carried four masts for sails. The Great Western embarked on her maiden voyage from Avonmouth, Bristol, to New York on April 8, 1838 with 600 long tons of coal, cargo and seven passengers on board. Brunel himself missed this initial crossing, having been injured during a fire aboard the ship as she was returning from fitting out in London. As the fire delayed the launch several days, the Great Western missed its opportunity to claim title as the first ship to cross the Atlantic under steam power alone. Even with a four-day head start, the competing Sirius arrived only one day earlier and its crew was forced to burn cabin furniture, spare yards and one mast for fuel. In contrast, the Great Western crossing of the Atlantic took 15 days and 5 hours, and the ship arrived at her destination with a third of its coal still remaining, demonstrating that Brunel's calculations were correct. The Great Western had proved the viability of commercial transatlantic steamship service, which led the Great Western Steamboat Company to use her in regular service between Bristol and New York from 1838 to 1846. 
she made 64 crossings, and was the first ship to hold the blue ribband band with a crossing time of 13 a days westbound and 12 a days 6 hours eastbound. The service was commercially successful enough for a sister ship to be required, which Brunel was asked to design. Brunel had become convinced of the superiority of propeller-driven ships over paddle wheels. After tests conducted aboard the propeller-driven steam tug Archimedes, he incorporated a large six-bladed propeller into his design for the 322-foot Great Britain, which was launched in 1843. Great Britain is considered the first modern ship, being built of metal rather than wood, powered by an engine rather than wind or oars, and driven by propeller rather than paddle wheel. She was the first iron-hulled, propeller-driven ship to cross the Atlantic Ocean. Her maiden voyage was made in August and September 1845 from Liverpool to New York. In 1846, she was run aground at Dundrum, County Down. She was salvaged and employed in the Australian service. And today she is fully preserved and open to the public in Bristol, UK. In 1852 Brunel turned to a third ship, larger than her predecessors, intended for voyages to India and Australia. The Great Eastern was cutting-edge technology for her time almost 700 EFT long, fitted out with the most luxurious appointments, and capable of carrying over 4,000 passengers. Great Eastern was designed to cruise non-stop from London to Sydney and back, and she remained the largest ship built until the start of the 20th century. Like many of Brunel's ambitious projects, the ship soon ran over budget and behind schedule in the face of a series of technical problems. The ship has been portrayed as a white elephant but has been argued by David P. Billington that in this case Brunel's failure was principally one of economics a euro his ships were simply years ahead of their time. His vision and engineering innovations made the building of large-scale, propeller-driven, all-metal steamships a practical reality, but the prevailing economic and industrial conditions meant that it would be several decades before transoceanic steamship travel emerged as a viable industry. Great Eastern was built at John Scott Russell's Napier Yard in London, and after two trial trips in 1859, set forth on her maiden voyage from Southampton to New York on June 17, 1860. Though a failure at her original purpose of passenger travel, she eventually found a role as an oceanic telegraph cable heir. Under Captain Sir James Anderson, the Great Eastern played a significant role in laying the first lasting transatlantic telegraph cable which enabled telecommunication between Europe and North America. Rankio Hospital During 1854 Britain entered into the Crimean War, and an old Turkish barracks became the British Army Hospital in Scutari. Injured men contracted a variety of illnesses a euro including cholera, dysentery, typhoid and malaria euro due to poor conditions there, and Florence Nightingale sent a plea to the Times for the government to produce a solution. Brunel was working on the Great Eastern amongst other projects, but accepted the task in February 1855 of designing and building the War Office requirement of a temporary, prefabricated hospital that could be shipped to Crimea and erected there. In five a month the team he had assembled designed, built, and shipped prefabricated wood and canvas buildings, providing them complete with advice on transportation and positioning of the facilities. Brunel had been working Gloucester Docks based William Esri on the launching stage for the Great Eastern, a man who had designed and built wooden prefabricated huts used in both the Australian Gold Rush, as well as by the British and French armies in the Crimea. Using wood supplied by timber importers Price and Company, Esri fabricated 18 of the 250 patient wards designed by Brunel, shipped directly via 16 ships from Gloucester Docks to the Dardanelles. The Rankio Hospital was subsequently erected near Scutari Hospital, where Nightingale was based, in the malaria-free area of Rankio. His designs incorporated the necessities of hygiene, access to sanitation, ventilation, drainage, and even rudimentary temperature controls. They were fated as a great success, with some sources stating that of the approximately 1,300 patients treated in the hospital, there were only 50 deaths. In the Skitari hospital it replaced, deaths were said to be as many as ten times this number. Nightingale referred to them as those magnificent hearts. The practice of building hospitals from prefabricated modules survives today, 
with hospitals such as the Bristol Royal Infirmary being created in this manner. Personal life, in 1830, he was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society. On July 5, 1836, Brunel married Mary Elizabeth Hursley, who came from an accomplished musical and artistic family, being the eldest daughter of composer and organist William Hursley. They established a home at Duke Street, Westminster, in London. In 1843, while performing a conjuring trick for the amusement of his children, Brunel accidentally inhaled a half-sovereign coin, which became lodged in his windpipe. A special pair of forceps failed to remove it, as did a machine devised by Brunel to shake it loose. At the suggestion of his father, Brunel was strapped to a board and turned upside down, and the coin was jerked free. He recuperated at Taymouth, and enjoyed the area so much that he purchased an estate at Watcom and Torquay, Devon. Here he designed Brunel Manor and its gardens to be his retirement home. He never saw the house or gardens finished, as he died before it was completed. Brunel, a heavy smoker, suffered a stroke in 1859, just before the Great Eastern made her first voyage to New York. He died ten days later at the age of 53 and was buried, like his father, in Kensal Green Cemetery in London. He left behind his wife Mary and three children, Isambard Brunel Jr., Henry Mark Brunel and Florence Mary Brunel. Henry Mark followed his father and grandfather in becoming a successful civil engineer. Legacy A celebrated engineer in his era, Brunel remains revered today, as evidenced by numerous monuments to him. There are statues in London at Temple, Brunel University and Paddington Station, and in Bristol, Plymouth, Swindon, Milford Haven and Salt Ash. A statue in Nayland was stolen in August 2010. The top mast of the Great Eastern is used as a flagpole at the entrance to Anfield, Liverpool Football Club's ground. Contemporary locations bear Brunel's name, such as Brunel University in London, a shopping centre in Bletchley, Milton Keynes, and a collection of streets in Exeter, Isambard Terrace, Kingdom Mews, and Brunel Close. A road, car park, and school in his home city of Portsmouth are also named in his honour, along with one of the city's largest public houses. There is an engineering lab building at the University of Plymouth named in his honour. In a 2002 public television poll conducted by the BBC to select the 100 Greatest Britons, Brunel was placed second, behind Winston Churchill. Brunel's life and works have been depicted in numerous books, films and television programmes. The 2003 book and BBC TV series Seven Wonders of the Industrial World included a dramatisation of the building of the Great Eastern. Many of Brunel's bridges are still in use. Brunel's first engineering project, the Thames Tunnel, is now part of the London Overground Network. The Brunel Engine House at Rotherhith, which once housed the steam engines that powered the tunnel pumps, now houses the Brunel Museum dedicated to the work and lives of Mark and Isambard Kingdom Brunel. Many of Brunel's original papers and designs are now held in the Brunel Institute alongside the SS Great Britain in Bristol, and are freely available for researchers and visitors. Brunel is credited with turning the town of Swindon into one of the fastest growing towns in Europe during the 19th century. Brunel's choice to locate the Great Western Railway locomotive sheds there caused a need for housing for the workers, which in turn gave Brunel the impetus to build hospitals, churches and housing estates in what is known today as the Railway Village. According to some sources, Brunel's addition of a mechanics institute for recreation and hospitals and clinics for his workers gave Anur and Bevan the basis for the creation of the National Health Service. GWR's successor First Great Western has named its high-speed train power car No. 43003 Isambard Kingdom Brunel. GWR Castle Class Steam Locomotive No. 5069 was named Isambard Kingdom Brunel, after the engineer. And be a Western Region Class 47 diesel locomotive No. D 1662 was also named Isambard Kingdom Brunel. In 2006 the Royal Mint struck two A2 pounds coins to celebrate the 200th anniversary of Isambard Kingdom Brunel and his achievements. The first depicts Brunel with a section of the Royal Albert Bridge and the second showed the roof of Paddington Station. The post office issued a set of commemorative stamps. 
for the 100-year anniversary of the Royal Albert Bridge, the words I.K. Brunel Engineer 1859 were engraved on either end to commemorate his enduring legacy. The words had become obscured by paint, but were restored by Network Rail and revealed again in 2006. Brunel was the subject of Great, a 1975 animated film directed by Bob Godfrey. It won the Academy Award for Animated Short Film at the 48th Academy Awards in March 1976. At the 2012 Summer Olympics opening ceremony, Brunel was portrayed by Kenneth Brunner in a segment showing the Industrial Revolution. The 2013 album The Last Ship by Sting contains the song Ballad of the Great Eastern. See also, Works of Isambard Kingdom Brunel a Euro list of Wikipedia pages, Lindsay House a Euro Isambard's childhood home, notes. References, Beckett, Derek. Brunel's Britain. David and Charles plc. ISBN 978-0-7153-2360-1. Billington, David P. The Tower and the Bridge, The New Art of Structural Engineering. Princeton University Press. ISBN 978-0-691-02393-9. Brunel, Isambard. The Life of Isambard Kingdom Brunel, Civil Engineer. Longmans, Green & Company. OCLC A3202088. Buchanan, R. Angus. Brunel, The Life and Times of Isambard Kingdom Brunel. Hambledon and London. ISBN 978-1-85285-525-3. A Chisholm, Hugh. Ed Brunel, Isambard Kingdom. Encyclopedia Britannica. Cambridge University Presser, Davis, Ken. The Locomotives of the Great Western Railway, Part 14, Names and Their Origins A Euro. Lincoln, RCTS. ISBN A0-901115-75-4A. Dumpleton, Bernard. Miller, Muriel. Brunel's Three Ships. Intellect Books. ISBN 978-1-84150-800-9. Gillings, Annabel. Brunel. House Publishers Limited. ISBN 978-1-904950-44-8. Le Fleming, H. M., 1953. White, D. E., ed. The Locomotives of the Great Western Railway, Part 8, Modern Passenger Classes. Knidworth, RCTS. ISBN A0-901115-19-3A, Marston, Colin J. B. A Locomotive Numbering. Shepperton, Ian Allen. ISBN 7110 1445 0 X-1184A, Noakes. George Augustus. A History of the Great Western Railway 1895 a Euro 373 pages online at books.google.com, Rolt, LTC. 1957. Isambard Kingdom Brunel. Prentice Hall Press. ISBN A 978-0-582-10744-1 A Rolt's highly acclaimed biography of Brunel is still the best and most complete. Adrian Vaughan. Isambard Kingdom Brunel, Engineering Knight Errant. John Murray. ISBN A 0 7195 4636 2. A Vaughan presents some interesting interpretations in this volume. His 2006 Brunel, an engineering biography, is a more orthodox interpretation with notable reproductions of engineering drawings. Wilson, Arthur. The Living Rock. The Story of Metals Since Earliest Times and Their Impact on Civilization. Woodhead Publishing. ISBN 978-1-85573-301-5. Further reading, Isambard Brunel. The Life of Isambard Kingdom Brunel, Civil Engineer written by Brunel's son, Celia Brunel Noble. The Brunels, Father and Son are written by Brunel's granddaughter, it adds some family anecdotes and personal information over the previous volume, Sir Alfred Pugsley, 
ed. The works of Isambard Kingdom Brunel, an engineering appreciation and a technical presentation of Brunel's opus, Rob Powell. Brunel's Kingdom A Euro Photography and the Making of History. Watershed Media Center. ISBN A 0 9510539 0 6 A study of how early photography portrayed Victorian industry and engineering, including the celebrated picture of Brunel and the launching chains of the Great Eastern, Stephen Brindle. Paddington Station, Its History and Architecture. English Heritage. ISBN A 1 873592 70 1 A. Andrew Mathewson and Derek Laval. Brunel's Tunnel. And Where It Led. Brunel Exhibition Rotherhith. ISBN A 0 9504361 1 9 A. Eugene Byrne and Simon Gurr. Isambard Kingdom Brunel, a graphic biography. Brunel 200 A. Christopher Silva. Renkio Brunel's Forgotten Crimean War Hospital. Valonia Press 2007. ISBN A 978-0-9557105-0-6 A. Derek Webb. Is. Parthian Books. Children's Book about the reincarnation of IKB with Key Stage 2 UK Curriculum Links. ISBN A 978-1-906998-11-0A, external links, obituary in. Archived from the original on January 19, 2008 to the time September 19, 1859, Brunel biography with additional images from the Design Museum, Isambard Kingdom Brunel www.bbc.co.uk. Retrieved August 27, 2009 -er, Brunel Portal, Animation of Brunel's Sketchbook. Electric Pavilion. Retrieved September 9, 2009 -er, Brunel Archives. University of Bristol. Retrieved September 9, 2009 -er, Review of the Intemperate Engineer by Adrian Vaughan. Will Robinson. Retrieved May 12, 2011 A.